Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us on this episode of Jumpstart You by Ad Journey. Our focus is on educating founders of early stage companies in accelerators, incubators, seed funds, etc. on the subject of branding, marketing, and effective communication. Today's episode that I'm excited to share is entitled, Don't Let Distraction Impede Action. And it's an interview with our featured guest, Lewis Foreman of Inventus Partners. Now, Lewis offers some great insight and resources for any entrepreneur on taking intentional and practical action for your best chance at success. With a storied career in entrepreneurship, including dozens of patents of his own, including hundreds for his clients, multiple successful business launches, an award-winning TV series, and professorship at multiple universities, <laughs> well, here's Lewis Foreman. Sykes and Trish. <laughs> uh, we're here to introduce you to Lewis Foreman. And uh, Lewis, I've read over pages of information um, about you, and I, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> uh, but I will say that I do know that you're the founder uh, and chief executive of Inventus. Is that correct? Inventus. Inventus. Um, okay, Inventus makes perfect sense. And uh, it's an integrated product design and engineering firm. But instead of me kind of hitting the highlights on everything, because I'm definitely going to send people to look at you on LinkedIn, give us a, a summary of a little bit about yourself. Yeah, well, thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to join you this afternoon. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. You know, I started my first business while I was in college. I took an econ class, learned about supply and demand. And I saw an opportunity where the marketplace wasn't addressing demand for our product. And so I started my first business out of my fraternity room. Fast forward 35 years later, I've been involved in the startup and creation of over a dozen companies. And okay. the current business I have today, Inventus, is a product design firm. So we work with startups, we work with small and mid-sized companies, we work with large Fortune 500 companies to design, engineer, develop, and launch consumer products and medical devices. Okay. So that's a pretty broad range. And, and during the time that you've been running this business, about how many um, patents have you been able to file for yourself and also for your clients? Yeah, personally, I'm the inventor on a dozen patents, but our firm has been involved in the development, the filing, or the monetization of hundreds and hundreds of additional patents. That's fantastic. So you're just the right guy for the people that we engage with. Um, our, our primary base is we do, we help with branding and marketing uh, for founders of entry level businesses. And, you know, this is startups and the incubators, accelerators, et cetera. So these are the kind of people who are looking for the kind of services that you provide, or at least definitely the wisdom that, that you can bring. So kind of on that note, uh, I'm going to run all over the place with this. But the first one is what can you say looking back? was a really good action you took early on that kind of resulted in the success that you find now. Yeah, well, I think action and execution uh, is, is, is really important. You know, what I find is that a lot of entrepreneurs talk about being an entrepreneur. A lot of people talk about the great idea or the business idea that they want to create, but without execution, without follow through, all you have is a bunch of really great ideas. And so I think first and foremost, You've got to decide when the time is right and actually move forward and execute on your plan. But you also need to make sure that your idea is actually feasible. And so, you know, on the flip side, you have, you know, people who never do anything. But on the other side, you've got people who do things, but they realize later that the timing wasn't right or the business right. wasn't feasible. And that's part of the failure. Certainly, certainly. Um, here's something I always think is interesting, but if you could go back uh, you know, we all make mistakes in business, but are there places in the mistakes that you would undo or do you consider it all part of the course and those were necessary to get you to where you are? 
Well, you know, I think failure and mistakes are part of the process because you learn from those mistakes. You learn from those small failures and it makes you stronger. It makes you avoid those mistakes in the future. I think if, if I had to go back in time and you know, give myself, you know, a pep talk, it would be avoid the distractions. You know, don't get distracted by the bright, shiny object. Don't think that you can do everything. Focus on your core business. And I also would have told my, my younger self to make sure you surround yourself with people who complement your skills. You don't want to have a room full of people who are visionary or, you know, have, you know, kind of the, the sales attributes. You want to make sure that you've got the operations and the finance and the logistics. So, you know, build out a team because then it makes the journey that much more enjoyable. I like that skill set mindset of, of surrounding yourself, especially with those that are outside of your skills. It's easy for us to find those that are kind of like us and, you know, out of boys and pat us on the back and keep us moving in the right direction. But they can also sidetrack us. <laughs> we like to become. Yeah, you end up you end up spending a lot of the time, you know, just kind of visualizing what the future is going to be and never actually accomplishing it. Yes, mm -hmm. certainly. Um, how early after you started uh, your current business? was your brand as it is now solidified? Yeah, we started Inventus in November of 2001. So it was a, a pretty strange time. You know, it was right after 9-11. Um, the world yeah. was somewhat in transition. Um, so we've been at it almost 21 years now. But very early on, we realized that our brand had to stand for something. And for us, it was about trust. Uh, okay. Today, when you're launching a product or a service, you end up working with a variety of service providers, whether it's design or engineering, brand and marketing, uh, web development, videography, PR. And if the product's not successful, there's a lot of blame. And so what we wanted to do was, you know, get compensated based on success, not just effort, and right. share in the success with our partners rather than just charge them by the hour. So for <laughs> us, the brand was, was so important to us uh, and, and our brand had to stand for for trust because ultimately we were being held accountable for success or failure. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I think this is interesting because I'm going to segue away from my original question to one that ties into something I read uh, that you had listed. Is you had you were asked uh, about you know some advice that you would like to have or be able to give to somebody who's launching a product, and you said you believe there was five questions before spending money on your great idea. Uh, and I liked all five of those questions. I'll just rehash them real fast, just so you don't have to recall them. Um, your idea probably isn't unique. You need to clarify uh, or clearly define your customer, determine demand, outline a path to financial success, and figure out the funding. Uh, when you're talking about brand, it's interesting because in what we do, branding is addressed in those first three questions. Um, and this is something that we talk about all the time with clients is number one, they haven't figured out who their target audience is. Um, you know, they're really good at what we call turning the rich, which is they know how to do the service or job if their business is established, but they haven't nailed down how to communicate to an audience that they have not yet even identified. Um, so I think this is really an interesting, interesting piece that you put here with your own uh, endeavors and experience you've had. Uh, how would those questions you think might have helped you at the outset when you were first launching into business? Well, you know, those those questions seem so simple when you look at them today. Yeah. Um, but a lot of entrepreneurs just get excited about the journey and they don't think about what they need to pack for the trip. Yes. And so those five questions really prepare you for this adventure. You need to make sure that what you have today is actually wanted by your customers, that there's something that differentiates your product or service from your competition. Because let's face it, the competition has the advantage. They're the incumbent. They're already there. They're already selling to your customer. And so you, not only do you have to convince your customer not to buy the product they're buying, but you got to convince them to then buy yours. And that's a challenge. So you've got to have some value proposition, some reason why your product is unique and why people would buy the product from you. Certainly. I agree completely. Um, what would you say that your brand does, Inventus, that makes the biggest impact on the market? Well, I think we were first and, and really one of the only companies out there to integrate all of the essential 
services necessary to go from that sketch on a napkin to the store shelf. And so by providing all those resources, ultimately, we can be held accountable for success or failure. Now, it's not to say that every client uses us from A to Z. Some people may just come to us for design and engineering services. Some may come to us just for prototypes. Some people hire us to launch their crowdfunding campaign. But because we understand the interaction of all those resources and what success looks like, we can provide great guidance to our clients. Okay, that makes sense. Um, for yourself, how long was it from start until you began to see a true profit in business? That was relatively quick. So, you know, we started the business in 2001. We knew that we had a compelling value proposition that what we were offering um, was valuable to our customers. Uh, and, and quickly, you know, we, we grew our business based on profits. We didn't grow it based on raising large amounts of capital from outside investors. In fact, we never looked for outside investment. We built the business responsibly, uh, and that's what we continue to do today. That's fantastic. And it's very a rarity in business. Uh, that's our approach to, to running business as well as, you know, the, the profits are what fuel the business. We don't take out lines of credit and whatever else to try to make things happen. Uh, yeah, building responsibly is extremely attractive. I mean, like that, right. that responsibly part is is the security in just that word and the focus on it and the drive for it is massive, especially right. in such an uncertain climate, either, you know, the, the market climate or even the business itself, the uncertainty of whether the product is in line or not, knowing you're aiming at doing it responsibly is incredible. Yeah. It's yeah. And, and I certainly can make, make a case for and against that approach. Uh, when we did it 20 years ago, the, the concept of raising large amounts of money and, and build, you know, by losing money and build market share um, was not nearly as prevalent as it might have been just in the last 12 months. Sure. But, you know, what we were able to do is manage our growth. And, you know, right. maybe we would be five times larger if we raised a bunch of capital. But, we also have built a really great culture within our company, which is important to us as well. Yeah, I like that. Um, so what piece of advice, whether it's something that's received or you've experienced it firsthand, would you share to be an asset to anyone else starting a business? Um, and this might even tie back into those five questions, but you, know, you go ahead, take the lead. Wow, you know, in, uh, in 35 years of being an entrepreneur, there are a lot of life lessons that emerge. Um, you know, some of those are, you know, related to surrounding yourself with the right people, the right team. Uh, entrepreneurship is not a solo sport. You need to have a really good team to support what you're doing. Obviously, you got to be focused and you got to be driven and you got to make sure that you understand, you know, kind of where you're headed and what the value of the prize is, because that's what motivates you. Right. But you also need to make sure that you're providing, you know, value um, to your customers. Uh, today, Customers have a lot of choices. You know, I, I can't think of a time in history where there weren't more products available um, to satisfy what the current needs of consumers are. And so you've got to figure out how you keep customers loyal, how you continue to innovate to keep them, you know, interested in what your product or service is. And you always have to be looking at what's new. How are you going to, you know, either, um, disrupt the current industry or avoid being disrupted yourself. Right. Okay. Um, what do you think is a core concept you bring? What is it that makes you you? Oh, wow. You know, that's, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I think everyone has their own superpower. Um, right. Maybe mine is a certain level of optimism. Maybe it's the passion that I, you know, try to bring to everything that I do that I really believe, you know, in, in our product, uh, in our team, uh, in the vision of our business, or it may just be the tenacity, you know, the, the, you know, unwillingness to give up, you know, no matter how bad things get some days, you know, the next day has hope and optimism. I like it. Optimism is a great trait to have. <laughs> um, so what defines a good goal for you and by what time marker should people begin evaluating? Yeah, you know, goals have to be attainable, but they can't be too easy. 
uh, every year I sit down, you know, and, and kind of set my goals for the next year. It's, it's almost like setting my New Year's resolutions. Uh, and then by the end of the year, I kind of evaluate those and I grade myself uh, to see, you know, how well I did against those. You don't want to have things that are too easy because then they're really not a goal. They're just kind of daily tasks. On the other hand, they can't be too far out there because it can be a little bit, you know, unsettling and uh, demoralizing when you don't meet them. So you've got to you've got to just make sure that you raise the bar a little bit each time, so this way you continue to to jump higher and higher. Awesome, I like that. Um, tying right into that with evaluating things and measuring things, I once read that if it isn't measured, it doesn't count, and I love the, the play off of numbers. But uh, how do you see that being applied within the workplace, particularly in regards to launching products and kind of getting started with a brand new uh, business? Yeah, you know, measurements and metrics uh, need to be defined by you, right? So as an entrepreneur, we have that that luxury that we don't have to, you know, measure based off of what Wall Street wants us to measure by or what our investors want us to measure by, and so. Certainly one metric is sales and revenue and profits, but it also could be accomplishment. It could be things that are good for consumers. It could be good for the environment. Um, some of it is self-satisfaction that, that we proved everyone wrong and we were actually able to do what we set out to do. And so I, I'm always caution, cautioning you know, entrepreneurs to you know, make sure that they define success based on what they believe is important versus what you know, the rest of, you know, the, the population thinks is important. Certainly. Okay. And then Trish and I are both avid readers. If you were to see around me, you'd see books kind of littering our floor. Uh, but what books for you have kind of topped your list of practical wisdom, business advice, or something you've read that's kind of really made a big imp uh, impression on you and maybe you've implemented uh, in your business and your doings? Yeah, I try to devour as much content as I possibly can. And whether it is books, whether it is podcasts, uh, I, I read probably 20 or 30 magazines every month. So trade journals uh, from every industry that we do business in, because you learn from what's happening in other industries and how it may translate into your industry. Always looking at best practices of uh, other industries to see how those may apply to what you're doing. And so you need to always be learning. And one of the, you know, one of the greatest things that I'm able to do is, you know, I teach uh, entrepreneurship at, uh, at a couple of universities and it's wonderful to be surrounded um, by thought leaders because you're always looking for kind of new trends, um, new thoughts, new possibilities that can change your business. Yeah, fantastic. Within that, is there a book that's kind of been the, the one that kind of launched you in that creative space? You know, I wouldn't say that there's necessarily a book that had taught me what I needed to know. But there have been plenty of books, especially, you know, kind of the biographies of founders that are inspiring. Because, you know, very early on when I was in college, what inspired me to really pursue being an entrepreneur were the stories of individuals who weren't that different than you and I, right. but the difference was they actually followed through with their idea. And you start to realize just how important it is to take that first step, you know, to walk that first block, you know, to go that first mile, um, you know, without turning around. And if you persevere, you'll eventually succeed. I saw that you had, were the creator of a four season, two time award winning, Emmy award winning PBS TV show, The Everyday Edisons. Uh, how did that kind of come about? And what were some kind of highlights that you kind of really got out of that that was enjoyable? Yeah, boy, those, uh, those, were, those days are, are long past. But uh, <laughs> back in 2005, when reality TV was the rage and there was a TV show for pretty much everything, you know, cooking, dancing, fashion, there wasn't a show based on innovation. There was no Shark Tank yet. And, you know, it seemed like there was an interest in this process of how do you go from that sketch on a napkin to the store shelf? We decided that we would do it ourselves. 
And so we built a prototype basically, and we did a casting call in Charlotte, North Carolina at a local PBS station to see if people would actually show up and share their ideas. Right. And it was hugely successful. Hundreds and hundreds of people lined up to share their ideas. So we ended up going to Atlanta and Nashville and Tampa and Columbia, South Carolina, and thousands of people showed up. And we realized that we were really striking a chord with consumers, that there were a lot of people out there who had a great idea, but they weren't necessarily interested in taking on the risk of being an entrepreneur. They didn't want to risk their kids' college education. They didn't want to quit their day job. They certainly didn't understand the process of how you go from that idea to turning it into a product. And so our, the first season of Everyday Edison's launched in 2007. We were in 85% of the U.S. market on PBS. We were really the first reality show for PBS. Right. And over four seasons, 52 episodes, what we were able to do was not only make people's dreams come true by seeing their idea, their sketch on a napkin end up on a store shelf, but also interview successful inventors and entrepreneurs, guys like Jeff Bezos and James Dyson appeared on our show and shared their stories, how yes. they went from a great idea to a successful business. Now you pointed out something really interesting and the notion of risk, and this is something that you run into. So what is it you think that's in the entrepreneur to make them willing to take that first step in risky space? Yeah, you know, teaching entrepreneurship, uh, you know, the debate is, can can you teach someone to be an entrepreneur? And, and what I tell my students is that, you know, I can't necessarily teach you to be an entrepreneur, but I can teach you the skills and the tools that entrepreneurs use to be successful. Because at the end of the day, being an entrepreneur is about managing uncertainty. It's not just the risk and reward, it's the fact that there's no playbook. Um, every day is gonna be a completely different adventure. And you've got to be able to process that risk reward, that uncertainty, not necessarily just on spreadsheets, but you got to process that in your gut. You got to be able to look at a situation and very quickly get comfortable with the decision that you make to either move forward or turn around or pivot. And so, you know, I think what entrepreneurs are really good at is managing that uncertainty, being able to look at a situation and really determine, is there enough juice for the squeeze? Right. No, I like that. Great answers. Um, so are there any kind of takeaways, uh, points that you might want to offer to people that are looking, they're ready to push into that unknown space and launch their own business? What would be kind of the, the top piece of advice you might throw in their direction? Yeah, you know, I would say the top piece of advice is make sure the product or service that you're looking at creating is unique. What differentiates it from the competition? And so it, maybe it's better designed, maybe it's better for the environment, maybe it's more efficient to use, maybe it's less expensive because you've come up with some manufacturing process or technology that delivers it at a better price. But you've got to make sure that there's something that really differentiates it from the competition because otherwise you're, you're already behind in the game. And then once you've figured out what that product is, make sure there's demand because sometimes we as entrepreneurs are guilty of inventing the hundred dollar aspirin. We come up with something that works better than what's already out there, but the price that we have to sell it for costs more than the problem it's solving. Yeah. Agreed. We have some tiny entrepreneurs in our life that, uh, they fit the bill of entrepreneur in that way. <laughs> Let's figure out how to make a, what would normally be a $1 box of pasta from the store. Let's start all the way back to inventing the machine that already exists to make pasta. And let's spend all the time and all the money to have the same outcome that could have gotten us about 30, you know, 30 minutes down the road of the store and a, a buck later and we've got pasta and we actually get to eat tonight. So, <laughs> we got the this, is, both. this is reference of our youngest who's uh he's a personality and he's a creator and an inventor by nature yes. um, so everything has to be a, the most complicated way to do everything so i'm trying to teach him it's great <laughs> to have that skill set but it doesn't have to be applied to everything <laughs> um lewis thanks so much for participating with us man I, this was fantastic information great advice i'm looking forward to be able to share this with the community uh, where can people find you and uh, who are the kind of people that 
you're really looking to be able to serve. Sure. Well, the easiest way to track us down is inventuspartners.com. Um, and so I'm assuming that you'll share the website with, uh, sure. with your listeners, with your viewers, so this way they can find us easily. Um, there's just such a wealth of information on the site, whether it's around product development, whether it's around crowdfunding your product. Um, we believe very you know, strongly in sharing all of this information for free. It's all available online so you can just learn from it. And if ultimately you need our help for that product or that service, you know, we're available as well. But you know, we want that journey for all entrepreneurs to be you know, safe and successful. Awesome, fantastic. Um, last words, do you have any takeaways that's important to you? Yeah, you know, I think, uh, I think the most important thing is, is you know, pursue something that you're really passionate about. Uh, that passion, uh, it, it's contagious, it's infectious, and, and in a good way, right? Um, yeah. You know, if you don't love what you're doing, find something that you do love. Certainly. Thank you again. Whenever we wrap up a consulting session with a client, we always rehash the takeaways. Yeah. Those little morsels of substance to chew on. Selecting just three from Lewis Foreman was kind of difficult. Very much so. Uh, but our first one, I think, is a really good action step is action and execution are crucial. Without follow through, all you have is a bunch of ideas. The second one, I think, would have to be make sure your ideas are actually feasible. The third thing, the competition has the advantage. They're already incumbent. You not only have to convince your customer to not buy from their current solution, but also convince them to now buy yours. Again, this is Brian. And Trish. Co-host of Jumpstart You by Ad Journey. And until next time, y'all be blessed. Well, my name is Lewis Foreman and I am the founder of Inventus Partners, and it's been a pleasure to be on Jumpstart You. Down.